Welcome to Pierce Park Sailing Center, Ocean Science After School. Since we can't do after school in any of the school buildings anymore, we're gonna be making some short videos at Pierce Park for you to learn at home and do some of the activities that we do in Ocean Science After School. Today, we'll be learning a little bit about the history of the Boston Harbor Islands by making a booklet. And you'll be able to see the directions on how to print this booklet. For all of our lessons on Ocean Science After School, visit piersparksailing.org slash O-S-A-S for Ocean Science After School. Our Boston Harbor Island history lesson has a book that accompanies the lesson. You can visit the website, click on the book to download it. Print the book. Make sure that the settings are on print on both sides and flip on short edge for all of the pages to line up. If you don't have a printer at home, that's okay. You just need seven pieces of paper to staple together and then you can draw the things that we have inside the booklet. Once the book's done printing, or if you're just using 14 blank pieces of paper, actually seven to do double-sided, you take the book, fold it in half at Pettix Island, so that the front page is Boston Harbor Islands. Make sure the crease is nice and strong so the book stays flat. And then staple it right on the edge. And that's it, you're all set to go. So, the Boston Harbor Islands were not always islands. 15,000 years ago, Boston Harbor was covered by a glacier a giant piece of ice, and the area that the glacier covered was known as the Boston Harbor Basin. On the first page of your book, you can see I've made a little X where we are in East Boston, and colored in the area of the Boston Harbor Basin in light blue. I also have this image here, which we'll put up on the screen, for you to see how much of Boston Harbor used to be land. So 9,000 years ago, the sea level was about 25 meters lower than it is right now, which is about 80 feet. So if you've ever been sailing with us before, you know between high tide and low tide, it's about a 10 foot difference. So if you imagine low tide and then you take that away eight more times, you can imagine just how much of Boston Harbor it used to be land. About 6,000 years ago, uh, as the glacier continued to melt, some of the islands began to appear in the outer harbor. And by 3,000 years ago, most of the Boston Harbor Islands that we know now had come forward. They're created as drumlins because as the ice melted and the glacier pushed down into Massachusetts Bay, it made the formations of the Boston Harbor Islands that are kind of shaped like an upside down spoon, two or three big hills usually. Boston Harbor is an estuary see on the next page of your book. An estuary is an area where the ocean comes together with rivers that drain into the ocean. So there's a combination of fresh water from the rivers and salt water from the ocean. In Boston, the three rivers, the three main rivers that drain into the harbor are the Charles, the Neponset, and the Mystic Rivers. This creates wetlands, which are a really special type of habitat because it makes a place for animals to live and also acts as a carbon sink that takes a lot of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and puts them back into the ground. Wetlands also help us because when we have big storms and there's a lot of surge from the ocean, the water will be absorbed by the wetland and lower the impact on the rest of the areas of the land. A lot of animals that you probably know live in wetlands in estuaries. Uh, some of the most common ones are bivalves, which are animals with two valves that come out. One brings water in and the animal eats the nutrients from the water and then the other spits the water back out. And some of animals like this are oysters or clams. And then right in our Belle Isle Marsh in East Boston, you can find all kinds of other animals too. People have been living in the Boston Harbor Islands for over 8,000 years. Of course, when they first arrived, the islands weren't islands yet. Uh, but as the glacier melted away, people started to use the Boston Harbor Islands that lived in this area. How did they get here? They walked here across the Bering Land Bridge uh, about 10,000 years ago or more, 
across North America and made their way all the way to Boston Harbor. The largest tribe that lived around and used the Boston Harbor Islands was the Wampanoag tribe. It was a powerful alliance of tribes. There were tens of thousands of people that belonged to the Wampanoag tribe. And more than 3,000 of them, for an example, lived just on Martha's Vineyard. Um, they used the islands in Boston Harbor for farming, for trading, for fishing. Uh, other tribes that lived in and around the Boston Harbor Islands were the Maswatuset, Mashpee, and Nipmuc tribes. About 400 years ago, some of the first European colonizers started to arrive at the Boston Harbor Islands um, from England. When they first arrived in Massachusetts Bay and in Boston Harbor, the Wampanoag tribe was led by a chief named Massasoit. And at the beginning of English colonization in Massachusetts Bay with the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the colonists got along peacefully with Massasoit. But as they continued to take more and more land, um, just in between 1630 and 1640, more than 20,000 English colonists came to Massachusetts. Ten tensions with the Wampanoag tribe began to rise. And when Massasoit passed away, his son, Metacomet, took over the Wampanoag tribe as chief. And tensions with the English colonists continued to rise. The English colonists called Metacomet King Philip. And the tensions eventually broke out in a war that was called King Philip's War. Many of the native Wampanoag people were killed during this war, and some of them that agreed to pray Puritan prayers were moved to praying camps, which were like internment camps on Long Island and Deer Island in Boston Harbor. This was the first prison that existed on Deer Island, and another one followed later. Some were also interned at Pettix and Brewster Islands and were really abandoned out there um, and had to just live off the resources that existed on the island. Around this period of time also, some people believe that the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts when it was formed didn't participate in the slave trade because they were a part of the Union Army in the Civil War. But that's not the case. In fact, the first slave ship that was constructed in the United States was built in Massachusetts in the town of Marblehead. And it was called the Desire Slave Ship. And it would take native people that had been captured by the colonists um, and trap them on the vessel and then sail down to the uh, Caribbean where the native people would be sold into slavery and traded for cotton, tobacco, and for enslaved people from West Africa who were brought back up to Massachusetts Bay. That trade actually made a lot of Massachusetts families wealthy, um, and that trade route continued on for many, many years after the tensions from the colonists and the native people first started to rise with King Philip's War. You can see on the next page of your book, there's an image of the Mayflower, which was the first colonist ship to arrive in Massachusetts Bay in 1620. And then 10 years later in 1630, the Winthrop fleet arrived. And from that time on, thousands and thousands of English colonists continued to arrive in Massachusetts Bay. At this time when this was first happening, East Boston was not the way that it looks now. It was made of five different islands. Noddle Island, Hog Island, Apple Island, Governor Island, and Bird Island. And you can see I've highlighted them on the page here in your book. These islands over time were filled in to create the East Boston that we know now that's connected by land where you can drive into Winthrop or Revere without having to get on a boat and cross water. That's the same for many areas of Boston, really the whole South Boston waterfront, the Back Bay, used to all be water, but were filled in over time. Today, Boston Harbor has 34 islands, but some of them are not actually islands anymore. Deer Island, Castle Island, Nut Island, Moon Island, and World's End all used to be islands, but are now peninsulas. They're connected to the mainland. 
Uh, they've been filled in at various times, or some of them, like Deer Island, uh, was separated by a body of water called the Shirley Gut until a storm. Now we'll go through and learn about some of the individual Boston Harbor Islands. Okay, next up we have Pettix Island, one of our favorite islands to go to in the Boston Harbor because it has forts, beaches, and lots of room to roam around. Uh, during the colonial period, the British used the island for farmland, and it was famously raided by the Sons of Liberty right before the Revolution. In 1900, a fort was built on the island called Fort Andrews. It was used during World War II to hold prisoners of war, and mostly uh, it held Italian prisoners of war, many of whom, after the war was over, ended up just staying in Boston and moving to the North End. It's also continuously been used as a fishing village, uh, mostly by Portuguese immigrants to Boston, and some of those buildings are still on the island today. Next up, we have George's Island, one of the best known Boston Harbor Islands because the ferry runs to it. It's very easy to access. It was used as farmland from the 1630s through about 1825. It also has a fort on it named Fort Warren, which is maybe the most famous fort on the Boston Harbor Islands because it was used as a prisoner for Confederate soldiers during the Civil War. A famous story from this era was that at the time, lobster was considered a disgusting food, not a delicious food like it is today. And the Confederate soldiers that were held at Fort Warren complained that it was cruel and unusual punishment that the Union Army had been feeding them lobster three times a day. Another famous story from Fort Warren is the legend of the Lady in Black, that the fort is haunted by a woman who was married to one of the Confederate soldiers held as a prisoner in Fort Warren, that she tried to sneak onto the island wearing Union Army clothes to break her husband free from the prison. When she was caught by the Union soldiers and tried, she was to be executed, but her one wish was to not be killed in the Union Army clothes. They didn't have any other clothes on the island, so they gave her black robes, which is how she got her name, the Lady in Black. Story is largely considered to not be true, but be careful when you go to visit George's Island anyway. Now we have Spectacle, the closest island to get to from here in East Boston by boat. Also one of the largest. Long ago, Spectacle Island was used as a glue factory. Before people had cars in Boston, they got around on horses. And when those horses passed away, they sent their bones to Spectacle Island to be turned into glue. Pretty gross. After that, it was used as a garbage dump. Uh, there's stories that there was so much disgusting garbage on the island that there would be methane explosions in the middle of the night that you could see from the city of Boston, big, huge fires in the sky. It was so polluted that the state had to come up with a plan with what to do with it. And during the big dig, when they were digging out the tunnels that go under the central artery in Boston, they used all of that fill to cover up Spectacle Island, encasing the dump and making it safe and a nice place to swim now that you can go and enjoy. Next up we have Rainsford Island. It's another one of our Piers Park favorites uh, because the beach is like a tropical paradise in the summertime. We can surf and kayak and all kinds of stuff out at the island. A sad part of the history of Rainsford is that there's over 1,700 people buried there. Uh, early in the colonial era, era, Rainsford Island was used for quarantine. And in 1730, a building was built there where any new immigrants to Boston that were quarantined were held. And many of them passed away and were left on the island. Today, there are no buildings left, just the beach. And it's well kept up by a man named Tom, who cleans the island and keeps it looking nice. Next we have Lovell's Island. Lovell's was used by the Wampanoag tribe for fishing. It's famous as being the site of many shipwrecks. 
It's hard to see the rocks that surround the island at high tide, and that's brought many captains too close to its shores and wrecked ships. It's one of the few harbor islands that you can camp on. Usually the campsites fill up very quickly early in the season, so book early if you're trying to go to levels. Now we have Long Island and Moon Island. Long Island also was inhabited by Wampanoag when before the colonial era. It was the site of an internment camp during King Philip's War. Uh, Moon Island now is used by the city of Boston for firefighter training. There's a big building that they light on fire and go into train, which is cool. And Long Island now is used as the site of Camp Harborview, one of Boston's most popular summer camps and a place where you can learn to sail, sail with Pierce Park Sailing Center in the summer. And our final island is Deer Island that we'll be learning about today. It was 1938 that a hurricane turned it into a peninsula by filling in Shirley Gut with land. During King Philip's War, over 1,000 Wampanoag tribe members were interned here. Uh, it was used in, as an Irish almshouse while Irish immigrants were coming to the United States um, and were either sick from not having eaten or were sick from disease. They were kept at this house. About 4,800 people lived here before coming into the city of Boston and about 800 of them died and still remain on Deer Island. That almshouse was turned into a prison which existed as a prison until 1991 when they started to convert the island into a wastewater treatment plant. Its most famous prisoner was Mark Wahlberg. That concludes our lesson about the Boston Harbor Islands. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Join us again for the next Ocean Science After School lesson here at Pierce Park Sailing Center.